Okay, so here's what we're working on. It's the charging RC circuit. So we're, we're going to charge a capacitor, put some charge in it, put some energy on it. Um, but we're going to go through, the, do that uh, using a battery, but the, um, we have a resistor in the way. The resistor can be either before or after. Remember the whole uh, system senses how much resistance is there and um, it will be, uh, the charging process will be slowed down accordingly. And so we've kind of started filling in uh, some of what happened, and we'll kind of, of course, just finish this uh, right now. So first of all, the capacitor starts off with no charge, and then eventually it will reach some full charge, which we'll find out what that is. And um, it will, of course, go from having no energy when there's no charge on the plates to having whatever full amount of potential energy is on there when we're finished charging it. Um, and the... Uh, um, of course, as goes the charge on the capacitor, so goes the voltage. So if you put more charge on a capacitor, there'll be a larger voltage drop across it. Initially, if there's no charge, then there's no voltage drop. And at the end, and I'll go over this again, we'll find that the voltage drop is the voltage drop across the charging battery. So the, that's the most voltage you can get to. Other things we'll fill in, of course, here, the voltage drop across the resistor, the current, those two always go together by Ohm's law. So what happens if one grows, the other one grows, if one shrinks, the other one shrinks. And of course, the power dissipated as well. Okay, so how much energy do we dump to the environment uh, through the resistor during this process? So I've gone ahead and circled, um, there's actually three distinct equipotential regions here, A, B, and C, because these are in series, the resistor and capacitor in series. So generally speaking, you have this fixed voltage drop, or the, this fixed voltage uh, of the battery that acts like your pump, and you generally will drop some of the voltage across the resistor, some across the capacitor. In that sense, it looks very similar to just two resistors in series, which of course, that's something that we've already talked about quite a bit. But, as we will see, introducing the capacitor makes how these two voltage drops are split with each other it makes them, it makes it evolve over time. So here's what happens. At first, there's no charge on the capacitor yet, so it has no voltage drop. So there's no voltage drop from here to here, which means that there is no voltage drop between B and C. Well, if you don't drop the voltage across from B to C, it has to all be, of course, be dropped through from A to B. So initially, it looks like this. So all the voltage is initially dropped through the resistor because the capacitor doesn't yet have any charge, so therefore it doesn't yet have any voltage difference. So I can write down here VC is equal to zero. There's no voltage drop across the capacitor. I can even label my equipotential regions. A is the highest, C is the lowest. But at this point, B is merged with C. There is no voltage difference between B and C yet because there's no charge in on the capacitor. Okay? So then the charge starts to flow. They start to accumulate on the plates. And as the charge accumulates on the plates, the voltage starts to accumulate as well. And of course, there's only so much drop to go around, so the sum of the two drops has to be this fixed battery voltage. So what happens is as the, this starts to increase, this starts to decrease. So basically what we have is that B is creeping upward. So what happens is as more and more charge builds across the capacitor, it starts to accumulate voltage, and that crowds out the voltage of the resistor. And B climbs all the way from the bottom here, where it's merged with equipotential region C, the lowest voltage equipotential, it climbs all the way up until it's actually merged with A. Okay? So at the end, this will be during the process, but the end of the line, the final, or full, will look like this. So now all the voltage drop is across the capacitor. So 
equipotential region A is still the highest, C is still the lowest. <clears throat> those don't change, by the way, because those are the battery terminals, right? Those A and, and C are the high voltage and low voltage terminals of the battery. It's B, though. B that's floating and it can change. So B starts off aligned with C, then it grows as char the charge uh, on the flows on the capacitor, its voltage grows, and then at the end, we're going to find it's gone up and merged with A. So now the voltage across the resistor is zero. Basically, the fact that the capacitor is charged is, is charging means it takes it more and more of the voltage drop until it takes the whole thing and the resistor is now not doing anything. It has no voltage drop. So we go back over here. Initially, the voltage across the capacitor is zero because the charge is zero. What's the initial voltage across the resistor? The battery. The battery. Okay. But by the end, the capacitor has grown to take all of it, so you can see that here, right? The capacitor takes all of it, and the resistors take it none. Okay? So they just basically switch roles. Okay? Initially, all the voltage drop is across the resistor, and at the end, it's all across the capacitor. At <coughs> In the charging process, they'll both take some. Okay? But it's just that the voltage across the capacitor here is increasing, and that's crowding out the resistor, so that's decreasing. So, um, initially there is a voltage drop across the resistor, so of course if you supply a voltage drop available across the resistor, current will flow, right? So we'll have some initial current, but remember, as goes the voltage across the resistor, so goes the current, right? The only reason that a charge flows across a resistor is when it has motivation to do so. That's a requirement, right? So if the voltage drops across the resistor, current will flow, but now we don't have any, right? There's no voltage drop across the resistor, what's the current going to be? Zero. Zero, exactly. So that must be, that by definition, the end of the line, right? If no, no more current flows, <clears throat> then that's as much charge and energy as the capacitor is going to get, right? Because if the current stops flowing, that's as that's the end of the line for that capacitor. Okay. Question? Could you also say that the initial current is going to be the maximum current? Yes, absolutely. It just goes shrinks down from there. That's right. So the initial current, that's the biggest it's ever going to be, and then it starts shrinking to zero at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can think of it conceptually, right? If if B is the same, grows to be the same voltage as A, why would charge go from A to B when there's no advantage to doing so. If you go from A to B, and B is the same voltage as A is, why would any charges burrow through that obstruction if they don't get a reward, right? So that's pretty much it. And by the way, um, the power dissipation, we can look at P equals I squared R, for instance, of course, will dissipate the most uh, power through the resistor at first, because the current's the largest. And of course, at the end, when the current actually stops flowing, then the resistor won't sweat out any more energy, right? Um, I guess while we're at it, we should probably point out, we can actually calculate Q full, what's the full charge. We can calculate the, uh, what else do we have? Initial current. We can calculate PE full, and we can calculate PE, P max, okay? These are all things we can find. Well, the general formula for Q is C times B, and now we know what is the voltage of the, at, uh, across the capacitor at the end. It's the battery voltage, right? So that's the most amount of charge that you can get on here with this battery, right? The most you can do is to charge this capacitor up to the same voltage as the battery that is connected to. So that's as full as it's going to get, okay? Well, 
What's I initial? I, well, I is V over R. What's the initial voltage across the resistor? The battery. The battery. Remember, the, at the beginning, the battery takes it. So that would be the maximum current. It will just decrease from there to zero. But at the beginning, the only thing holding that current flow, remember that capacitor is completely empty, open for business, OK? There's nothing on it yet. The only thing holding back the current flow at this point is the fact that there's a resistor in the way. And you have the full voltage drop of the battery across the resistor at first. And so that's the most current that you're going to get. This is also the maximum. So notice that the capacitor gets more and more charge, most charge at the end, but the resistor gets the most current at the beginning. And of course, we can use these Q full, we can use for P E full, just use whichever formula you want, one half uh, Q squared over C, for instance. And of course, what you put in is the Q full. So you put in one half times Q full, and you get one half C, well that'd be, that's kind of dumb. Uh, well, I don't know why I did this, this is stupid. Well, it's not wrong, but I should have just used one half CV squared, right? So that's the alternative formula for uh, potential energy, right? One half CV squared, and then I just put in what's the final V? Well, it's the battery EMF, right? Um, and then that, of course, is the maximum that will be at the end, because at the end, the capacitors where everything's going on. And then the power max, um, I'm not going to make the same mistake here. I'm going to use V squared over R, OK? That's one of the three forms of the power law. And what is the maximum voltage across the resistor? The battery EMF, right? And it happens at the beginning. Okay. So at the beginning, you're sweating out the most energy through the resistor. And then as you progressively go through and charge this thing up, eventually the capacitor fills up, hogs all the voltage drop, it has the most charge, most energy stored, and then that's all that this battery can do. This is the maximum that that battery can put on that capacitor, because the current eventually goes to zero, which means nothing more is happening. Okay, are there any questions on that? Okay, so that's the general character of the answer. Um, and again, as you can probably guess, this does not happen linearly, it happens exponentially. Because uh, it's one of those classic situations where at first, the capacitor is really excited to fill, right? It's got lots of empty space. And then it becomes progressively harder to add that last extra drop of charge. So these are all exponential. I'm going to have to, again, pull out the bare minimum of formulas for you guys to do this, and then the rest of them you can get yourself. So for instance, well, let me tell you the current function. This current function is exactly the same as the current function in the discharging. It looks like this. I versus T starts off at your initial value and eventually dies to zero. In both the discharging and charging, the current runs down to zero because at the end there's nothing left to do. In the discharging circuit, there's no more current because the capacitor's finished emptying. <clears throat> In this case, the charging circuit the current goes to zero because it's finished filling the capacitor, right? At some point, there's nothing left to do. The capacitor is either done emptying or done filling. So that's why the current function is the same. The current runs down to zero in both cases, OK? Um, the tau is exactly the same. That's convenient. Tau is R times C. It's the resistance that you are charging through and the capacitor you're trying to charge. And same deal with tau. That's often how we evaluate these, because of the exponentials that take forever to finish exactly. 
it takes forever technically to fill just because it gets progressively harder to squeeze on the last little bit. So we judge circuits by tau, which is again the time to drop to 37% of your initial value, having already dropped, of course, 63%. <clears throat> So what can you do with this? Well, of course, once you have the current function, you can get the power function, because it depends on just current. It's current squared times r. You can get the voltage function. Because again, it, as, as goes the current, so goes the voltage. So I guess we can find that out here real quick. The voltage across the resistor as a function of time will be this function times the resistance. We can group these terms that are not the exponential. And what is that term in parentheses there? What's I initial times R? Voltage. That's the initial voltage, which is, by the way, is what? It's battery enough. This function looks like this. So if you wanted to plot what does the voltage across the resistor look like, at the beginning it takes it all, but at the end it takes none. Okay. Just like we said, all we're really doing it is giving it a time axis, right? But we already said that the battery voltage is entirely across the resistor at the beginning and then not at all at the end. And this is just putting it to time. It's an exponential function. So this stuff's pretty familiar. Um, but definitely, in the last circuit, everything looked like this. Everything looked like an exponential that ran down to zero. But clearly, something else is needed for some of this stuff. Because some of this stuff grows, right? It grows with time. And this exponential in its raw form does not grow. It always goes to zero. So here's where I'm going to have to hand you one more function. That's the uh, charging function here. So let me tell you what that is. And again, this is just something that you can get off the formula sheet. It looks like this. It's got a few more bells and whistles. It's got a 1 in there, 1 minus an exponential. And that is, in fact, what allows us to grow and not shrink. Okay. So there are three things you can find on the formula sheet. You can find the charging, two charging functions. One is, uh, sorry, sorry, two RC uh, charge functions. One is this one, this is the charging circuit. The other one is the discharging. Okay, it looks like this. So this is the RC charging. That's versus the this equation. That's the RC discharging. It's pretty easy to know which one is which. Just look at the function, right? If it's a pure exponential, e to the minus whatever, it'll die. So that's got to be the discharging. And as I will show you, this new function actually grows. So those are the two of the functions. And then the third one is this. And this current function is good for both, right? So that's for both charging and discharging. Eventually, something there's no more current flow because you're done either emptying or filling the capacitor. So let's go ahead and look at the details of this charging function. There's some room here. It's really not all that different. It just has that extra 1 in there. But let's try it out. Let's plug in t equals 0. So q at t equals 0. That'll be q full 1 minus e to the minus 0. What's uh, e to the 0, or anything to the 0, for that matter? 1. 
But notice that 1 minus 1 now gives us 0, which, you know, we knew, right? It starts off empty, okay? Let's try t equals infinity. I'll wait a long, long time. e to the minus infinity, or anything to the minus infinity, right? That's a very large number uh, in the denominator. So what is this? What is this? Very simple. Yeah. In math class, we talk about limits. In physics, you just say, hey, it's zero. OK. So now we get 1 minus 0. So that's just a 1. So here we get q full. So this is uh, fulfilling all our expectations. It is growing, right? Because we're taking advantage of the fact that the exponential shrinks, but we're subtracting it from 1. So that actually makes it grow, OK? So um, I guess let's try t equals tau again. We learned that tau is an important benchmark. q full 1 minus e to the minus 1. So e to the minus 1, that's a number, right? e is about uh, 2.7, just shy of 3, right? So it's about 1 third. We learned that it was about 0.37. That's where the 37% comes from. And 1 minus that is just the 63. So it's about 63% of full at t equals tau. So let's draw that function. What does it look like? Here's what it looks like. The charge starts off at zero, and then at first makes a fairly sizable jump there to try to charge, size the charge at first, and then it starts to slowly charge slower and slower, and it really won't ever reach the quote unquote full charge until you wait forever. Okay? So that's why we have our tau. Our tau is once again. 63%, 37% benchmark. It's used for lots of, it's used for exponentials of almost any kind, okay? And again, while it seems odd to judge, to, to uh, why don't we ask how long does it take to fill halfway or something like that, 63, 37%, that's actually a nice number for E, okay? So once again, tau is the 63%, 37% benchmark. The only difference is that because it's growing, it represents the time it takes to grow to 63% instead of the time it takes to drop 63%, so only have 37% left. Okay. So uh, that's how we often judge one versus another, right? If we had, say, another one that charged more slowly, that also takes forever to charge, but if we're judging these two against each other, this one does take longer to reach this benchmark. Perhaps you're charging through a larger resistor. Remember, tau depends on the circuit. So having a larger resistance to ha that you have to charge through, or having a larger capacitance to charge, means it'll take longer to hit this benchmark. Okay? So that's what that looks like. And once you have that, you can get anything, uh, lots of other things from it. For instance, we know that as goes Q, so goes VC. So as the charge builds up on the capacitor, so will the voltage. Okay. So let's figure that out. 
um, the voltage function will just be the Q function divided by C. So we'll go ahead and put that in. Like that. And what is this thing here? What's Q full over C? Generally, Q, Q over C is V. Which V is this? It's a V full, right? What's the V full? How much voltage can we get on that capacitor? Battery voltage. That's right. So if we were to draw that, voltage versus time, it has the same, it has the same look. This is V full, this is V across the capacitor. And I want to label uh, my y-axis generically as V because I want to include my um, voltage across the resistor on the same one. The voltage across the resistor we said looked like this. We said they trade it off, right? And we can see it now with the time axis. Right? Oh, this, this is a bad drawing. This is supposed to asymptote out of this and it's like going past it. Like this. There we go. So initially, the resistor takes the whole drop and the capacitor doesn't have any because it has no charge yet. And by the time you get to the end, the capacitor has all the voltage drop and the resistor has none. By the way, what should be the sum of these two voltage drops at all times? The battery voltage, right? We said that in general, they're in series, so these two have to always add up to the battery voltage. We said that the capacitor increases its voltage, but it has to come at the expense of the resistors precisely because Kirchhoff's loop rule has to be obeyed, right? That the sum of the voltage drops has to always equal to zero, which means that the resistor and capacitor have to add up to the battery voltage, right? In fact, you can show, if you plug in both of those functions, which you've got these nice exponential functions, can you see what happens if you add these two up? The exponential part is going to cancel, right? This is going to have this, and this is going to cancel with it. And so it does add up to a constant, which is nice to see, of course. Okay, um, so I think that does it for this charging circuit. Are there any questions on that? Yeah. Does that little section where the two lines cross, does that have any significance? I'm going to ask you. They're equal. What is the value when they are equal? The they line. both always have to add up to the battery EMF. This is when they are the same. happen to be equal. That's right. They, they're covering at 50-50. So that's the point where they happen to have the same voltage drop, but of course that's just a momentary thing because if the voltage across the capacitor is going to grow and the one across the resistor is going to shrink, there'll be some point where they meet. It's not particularly significant, but you can infer exactly what the value is here. As far as what time that occurs, that is definitely going to be less than tau, right? Because tau is the time it takes to reach 63% of your eventual, and if you've only reached 50% of your eventual, you're not yet there. So tau would be probably somewhere about here. So tau is the time it takes to reach 63% of your final, not, not 50%. So that time that they cross is definitely not tau. Um, 
Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, so when I post homework four for you, uh, you know, just be prepared for some of the more tricky math stuff that you'll see. Um, we talked about Kirchhoff's rules with some simultaneous equations needing to be solved, and then this involves exponentials. That's about as difficult as the math really gets in this class. Okay, so uh, they happen to both be on homework four, so uh, that's why I wanted to have the cutoff for the first exam not include homework four. Okay, so you'll I'll post that homework for you shortly. You should have uh, a week to do it after you take your exam. It won't be due until uh, late next week. Um, but definitely don't start, um, uh, you know, um, last minute. Okay. Um, so, that covers the standard um, RC circuits, charging and discharging. Um, and, it actually covers a surprisingly large amount of circuits. Um, so for instance, for our discharging, I'll call it the standard discharging. It looked like this. So we had a capacitor that had been charged up in the past, and then it was going to discharge through a resistor. Now. Um, it's not necessarily just one capacitor and one resistor. It could be discharging through a whole network of resistors. That could be some equivalent resistance, okay? So that's where you use your skills of combining things in series and parallel, right? And it might not just be one capacitor. It might be a whole bank of capacitors that's discharging. And we'll learn how to find C equivalent. So again, I'm pushing off series and parallel um, Capacitors, because I think it's some of the easiest stuff, and I want to get to the harder stuff first. So, our standard discharging uh, equations can cover a whole bunch of capacitors discharging through a whole bunch of resistors. Okay. We just talked about our standard standard charging circuit that looks like this. And it need to not just be one capacitor being charged through one resistor. It could be charging through a whole bunch of resistors, and you could be charging a whole bank of capacitors. I guess you could even put a couple batteries there um, to, to do the charging. But even then, even though the, the uh, equations that I've given you cover a broad range of different uh, scenarios, there are what I'll call non-standard circuits. So, non-standard circuits. So how do you know if you have one of these non-standard circuits? Well, the one thing that we learned is that in both of these types, the current eventually went to zero, right? Eventually, there was nothing left to do. You were either completely done discharging or completely done charging, and there's nothing left to do. And if you have a circuit where the current never goes to zero, then you know right away that you have a non-standard circuit. Okay? So um, let me give you an example of one. like this. And I want to point out what happens here. Even after that capacitor is full, there's still a way around it, right? So the current will never drop to zero here. So if you see one of these, and you will see one of these, okay, what do you do? Well, one of the things that we do to uh, Make sure that the level of complication in this class is, isn't too big. You can't give me the time equations, okay? So if I, I can't ask you at five seconds what's going on. 
So you're going to have to talk in broad strokes. You're going to have to talk about what happens if t equals zero, what happens if t, after a long time, but not at specific times in between. So that is your limited scope on these situations. Okay? And here's what um, I will recommend. These are tools, by the way, that are useful even in the other ones. So these tricks that I'm going to introduce are ones that aren't just limited to, to the standard things. So let's talk about a capacitor that's completely empty. There's no charge on either plate, and there's no voltage drop across, of course, either. That functionally looks like a short circuit. An empty cap behaves as a short circuit, functionally. Now, what, what do I mean? I mean, here there is absolutely no impediment for charges to flow because, of course, this capacitor is completely empty, right? Completely empty parking lot. There's nothing to prevent the flow, just like along a piece of straight wire. Just like a straight piece of wire, we think of it as an equipotential, right? Well, that's what it is when you have a capacitor that's empty and it hasn't yet had a chance to accumulate a voltage drop. Now, you can't think of it too microscopically. Obviously, there's a difference, right? Here, it's the same charge carrier that shoots from one end to the other, whereas here, it's more of a relay race, right? One charge accumulates on the plate, and the po another positive charge leaves the other one. So, but if you don't think of it microscopically, functionally, that's what's going on. So, for instance, even over here, with the circuit we just finished, at t equals zero, you can functionally think of it like this. So you can functionally replace that empty capacitor with a short circuit. And that helps you really see why the voltage drop across the resistor is the entire battery voltage at first. And in problems like this, if you replace this capacitor with a straight piece of wire, you can, it'll help you calculate what's going on at t equals zero at the first moment. Okay. Um, the other, uh, of course, other extreme case is what happens when the, you have plus Q full, minus Q full, and the voltage across the capacitor, of course, is built up to its full value. Okay. Now, I should warn you that in these non-standard circuits, it may not necessarily be the battery voltage, okay? so watch out for that. You'll see why that is when you start working it out. Um, if this is a full cap, well, functionally, that's like a gap in the circuit. It's a uh, what we call an open circuit. So, same deal, no more charges would flow onto a capacitor if it's full, just like no charges can flow through a piece of wire that has an opening or gap in it. So, functionally, those two are the same thing. So that can greatly help you analyze as well. Now it's useful over here as well, okay, for our previous circuits. When we get to T equals infinity, what we effectively have is this. So it's very easy to see why there's no current, because there's nothing can get through. Right? Easy to see why the current goes to zero. But over here, we can do the same thing. When this is full, this branch is not being supplied with any current anymore, right? Because it's full up. 
So all the current will go where? It'll go around. Right? So it still has somewhere to go. So no current goes to the capacitor, but it has a bypass around that. And by the way, since you are still going to have current going around this way, there's still going to be voltage drop across here, right? So now the capacitor will be full before it reaches the battery EMF. Okay? So this may not be the EMF of the battery in a non-standard circuit. And you'll see that as you start to plug in these things and you'll find that that's not the case. Okay. So again, for these non-standard circuits, I can't ask you what's happening at five seconds. You don't have the equations for that. But you can say what's happening at the very beginning, where oftentimes the capacitor is empty and it acts like a short. And you can't say what happens after a long time when the capacitor is going to fill as much as it's going to fill and nothing flows to it. Are there any questions on that? Okay, so you have a bunch of these RC questions as well uh, on your homework, uh, and you will uh, be doing a lab on this as well where you look up all these things. Okay. So next order of business, we have our dielectrics. So this is a way to soup up the performance of a capacitor. Okay. This is a way to make it better. Every capacitor that you will use in the lab undoubtedly has one of these. Okay. What is it? So let's say I have a capacitor that I've charged up, like so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to put a filling in this sandwich. That is my dielectric. Dielectric, which really It's just an insulator. In fact, some people use the term insulator and dielectric interchangeably. Okay. I like to think of an insulator as just a general thing, and a dielectric is when you're using an insulator for this purpose. Okay. So what does this accomplish? Well, first of all, I guess I should mention, why don't you want that thing to be a conductor? That's fairly obvious, right? If you put a conductor in there, then you would just ruin the capacitor the pluses can flow across comply with the minuses. You've deleted your ability to store charge and energy by putting a conductor in there. So what does an insulator do? Well, uh, let me remind you uh, that just because it's an insulator doesn't mean nothing happens. We still have that ability for partial shielding, right? So if we have that the electric field of the plates looks like this, The material will charge polarize. They'll have the pluses, uh, let's see, the minuses want to go upstream, so they'll be like this, and the pluses will be downstream, so they want to go like this. You guys remember this, partial shielding? Okay. It doesn't look like it did before. I think before it looked like this, right? We had the external field, and then we had an insulator with charge polarization look like this. It just looks a little different now, but it's basically the same idea, right? And this creates what we call E-induced, right? So if I draw it here on the side, we have E external. That's by the plates. When I say external, of course, I mean external to this hunk of, uh, of insulator. I have E induced. And 
this is where I can remind you that, of course, the whole idea of an insulator is that you can't get perfect shielding, you can get just partial shielding. So if you combine these two, you'll get E net, which looks like this. It's in the original direction, right? It's in the original direction of the external field, just a little bit weaker, right? So we call this partial shielding. We found no practical use for this at the time when we were doing homework two. I just pointed it out. Now we're going to find that there's a very practical application to this. Okay. So if you had perfect shielding of conductors to think for getting inside something metal in a lightning storm or something like that, now we find um, partial shielding has a use too. Because this is going to improve the performance of the capacitor. Now, it may be not very obvious why this improves the performance, so we're going to have to go through it step by step. Okay. So, the first step I want to do is just establish my values. Okay. So, I want to establish, this is the... Uh, after the cap has gotten charged, but before I bring the dielectric around, before I insert it. So, ironically, even though it would take me a long, long, long time to charge it perfectly, this is my starting point for my discussion now. So, I want to talk about uh, the charge in the capacitor and the voltage. Um, I want to talk about the capacitance itself. Let me make sure I get everything on my list. Um, I want to talk about, let's see, oh, electric field. Sorry, these aren't going to be in the best order, but they're all going to be there. So this is going to be E net. Um, and talk about uh, potential energy. And my, I'll give them just, uh, you know, Q naught, uh, B naught. Uh, C naught, E naught, and P E naught. Those are the values that I'm going to jump off from. Okay. So the next stage I'm going to look at is I'm going to the battery is still disconnected. So I've removed the uh, capacitor from its charging uh, battery but I now I'm going to insert the dielectric. Okay. So one of the things I've just mentioned is the fact that the net electric field will be reduced, right? So that's the partial shielding, right? So, I have to tell you how that shielding is quantified, okay? So the way that we quantify this is that you might say, well, can we just say how much E induces, how much we subtract? We could do it that way, but it turns out to be more convenient instead of talking about how much is subtracted from it, um, by what factor is it changed? So we go E net is equal to E external divided by kappa, okay? Where kappa is a, called the dielectric constant of the material. Dielectric constant of the material. It's a unitless number, it's just a divider on how much we're reducing the electric field by. There are tables, of, there's a table of them on your formula sheet. 
So for instance, if a material has a dielectric constant, well, first of all, I guess I should say that it's one for nothing, right, for a vacuum. But it's bigger than one for everything else. Which means, of course, that we're dividing by a number bigger than one, which means we're reducing the field. So for instance, if you have a dielectric constant of three, that means that E net is one third of what it used to be, right? If we have a dielectric constant of 100, it means that the net electric field is only one one hundredth of what it used to be. It's a way of quantifying the partial shielding, and it's just doing it as a divider, okay? It's telling you how much you're dividing the field by, okay? Does that make sense? So if we go over here, the net electric field is divided by kappa is reduced, okay? But now what we're going to do is we're going to see that that trickles through to having effects on all of the other things, okay? The first of which is this. We, of course, talked about the relationship between electric field and voltage, and we've long since talked about it like this. And of course, I'm not changing D, I'm not changing the distance between the plates, which means that these two go together. The electric field strength and the voltage drop across the capacitor are tied together. So if I've reduced the electric field between the plates, I've also reduced the voltage. If I reduce, they're directly proportional, which means that if I've reduced the electric field by kappa, I'll also have reduced the voltage by kappa. So, what's going on here? For instance, I could have charged this capacitor originally with a 9 volt battery, which means that the voltage drop across is 9 volts. But then I could put in a kappa value of 2 and reduce the voltage difference to 4.5 volts. How is the voltage difference uh, reduced? Well, just think about it. If I were to suddenly discharge this with the dielectric in there, like this, it wouldn't be nearly as excited to discharge. Yes, this positive charge wants to get away from other positive charges on this plate, but not as badly, it's like, oh, there are these negative charges around. I kind of like those, right? You might ask, why doesn't it flow directly onto those? Remember that these are bound, right? They're hanging around nearby, but they're not actually really a part of the plates, right? They're not, they haven't joined the plates. Those are bound charges. So they're just kind of hanging out nearby. But uh, this positive charge in this plate is not going to be as excited to get off now. And by, when it flows across here, to get to this big store of negatives, it's not going to be as excited to join that because there are positive charges near there too, right? So it'll still flow, but not as excitedly. So that's why we say that the energetic motivation to go from one plate to the other is not as big, right? We've gone from 9 volts motivation to, if we put in a kappa of 2, it's only 4.5 volts now, okay? So. This seems like it's not a good thing, okay? We've reduced the desire of the charge to do this, um, but we're gonna find, of course, we haven't finished yet, we're gonna find that there's some advantages here. Now, as far as the charge goes, the charge on the plates, can anyone see, how does inserting the dielectric affect the charge that's on the plates themselves? It, it doesn't, right? We have these isolated islands of charge, right? We've, we've charged the capacitor up, we've disconnected the battery, so there's no on-ramp, no off-ramp, right? It's completely isolated. So the amount of charge is the same. We've just reduced the voltage difference between the plates, but the amount of charge actually on the plates, right? We're not counting the, the red charge here. We're not counting the bound charge, because that's not actually accessible charge. It's charges on the insulator. Okay, so 
Let's find out about the capacitance. Well, uh, of course, just like you can always relate these two, E equals V over D, you can always relate these three by C equals Q over V, right? So once you know about two of them, you can find out about the third. So let's take a look. Well, initially the capacitance was Q naught over V naught. It's a reflection of how much charge you can store per volt. Now, if we look at the new capacitance, if that is going to be our definition of capacitance, right? It's how much charge we can store per volt of effort. But now we have the same charge, but with less voltage. What is that going to do to the capacitance? It's going to be more. So we're storing the same amount of charge with less effort. Which you might rightly claim, this seems like a real technical loophole, right? What do you mean we're storing the same amount of charge with less effort? It's like a cheat, because we actually use the same amount of effort to charge it, but then we put in the dielectric afterwards to reduce the voltage difference, right? But if we're going to follow the letter of the law here, we do have an improved capacitance. And in fact, if this is reduced by kappa, then that kappa will flip up, and we've improved the capacitance by kappa. And by the way, as we mentioned, capacitance is a measure of the physical properties. So now we've actually changed the physical property of the capacitor by putting something in it. And so as long as it's in there, the capacitance will be improved. Okay? So the formula for capacitance really should be kappa times the, what the capacitance would be without the dielectric material. If you want, you can put in the parallel plate formula. So this is kind of your complete formula for calculating capacitance based on physical properties. You need to know the plate areas, you need to know the separation, and then you also need to know kappa, which is what is the material that is between the plates. Those are the physical properties that go into figuring out kappa. And as long as this uh, dielectric is in here, then that should be included in the calculation of capacitance. Okay? So, um, seems like the capacitance is improved on the technicality. We haven't really accomplished very much, and when we go to the potential energy, you'll really see that it seems like we haven't, this is, this is kind of pointless. Uh, let me do that next. So, I'll pick one of my potential energy formulas. I suppose uh, one half, let's do, which one I want to do? I guess I'll do one half QV. Remember, there's three forms. I'll pick whichever one seems the most instructive. If we have the same exact amount of charge stored, but at less voltage, that tells us we have what? What, what happens to the potential energy? It's less. It's less. We've stored less energy now. Because we have the exact same amount of charge carriers, but we have less energy per charge carrier. So we have, that's Q and V. So that should lead to less energy, right? Overall, the capacitor plates are isolated islands of charge, so there's no way to get on or off. So the amount of charge is the same. We just talked about the fact that we have these guys that are not a lot less excited to get off one plate to the other. The energy motivation has been reduced because of this partial shielding. So if we have the same number of charges. Each stores less energy per charge. We're going to get less potential energy. So. If Q is the same, V we already knew, know is reduced by kappa, V is directly proportional to PE, this is going to be reduced by kappa as well. So we really, of course, 
look at this and go, what? Why is this better? We're not storing any more charge than we used to. It's the same amount of charge. We've reduced the voltage difference. We've reduced the amount of energy stored. This seems like it's not an improvement, right? And it isn't yet, but we haven't fully leveraged the situation. We're going to do something else now. What we're going to do is we're going to reconnect the battery. Okay? We're going to reconnect the battery and see what happens. Actually, before I go through that, are there any questions? I'm not belaboring how these factors are coming up. I hope that you guys can just do it by proportionalities or can kind of see how that's going. Um, so here's what happens. When you connect the, so let's say we had that 9 volt battery that was, uh, we used to fully charge this thing up to 9 volts. We take it away, we put in this dielectric that may reduce the voltage to, a, you know, whatever kappa is, a half, might be a third, you know, kappa might be 2 or 3 or 100, and that reduces the, the voltage to a half or a third or a hundredth of what it used to be, right? So for instance, Let's say, um, let's say we had a 9 volt battery, right? We use that to charge it up, plus Q0, minus Q0. Then we disconnected that battery, and we just have the capacitor. It has plus Q0, minus Q0. Then we insert a dielectric. say kappa equals, uh, I don't know, let's make it, uh, what's an easy number, I guess three, uh, yeah, let, well, let, let me do the nine volts instead of, so let me do it 12 volts, let's see my charging battery is 12 volts, then I put in a kappa of three, okay, so what's my new voltage drop after that? Four volts. The partial shielding has reduced the voltage difference to four volts. And that's the situation we're at currently, but then, what do you think, if we rehook up the battery, the 12 volt battery, and hook it up to something that's four volts, is what are you doing? I just charged up to 12 volts. Now you've been consorting with these dielectrics and your voltage way down. What does it do? It wants to charge it more. It just wants to charge it more to get it back up to 12, right? So that's what it does. Okay? So when we reconnect it, we'll bring it up to back to 12 volts. 4 volts back up to 12 volts. Right? Get the dielectric in there. So the voltage comes back up. That's forced by the battery, right? The battery is going to insist. But the only way it can bring it up from 4 volts back up to 12 volts is by putting more charge on there, right? So more charge will flow, and now it's going to look like this. Which, by the way, that amount of charge could never have been put on there at first, remember it filled it up, right? It got it up to 12 volts here at the beginning, and that's as much charge as it took to get it up to 12 volts, right? It can never have put the amount of charge on that we're seeing now. We get to cram that much more charge on there because the suppressive effects on the, of the voltage, on the voltage of the dielectric means that the battery has to push that much more charge on there to get it back up. Does that make sense? So now we get even more charge than before. And now we're talking. This seems like it, it's a useful property, of course, to be able to get a lot more charge on there than you would have. So now we're not just letting the partial shielding do suppress the current situation. We're letting the partial shielding suppress so that we can then recover the original voltage with more charge. 
So let's go and figure out the amount. Um, if we look at good old C equals QB, hmm. now we can invert that to Q equals V times C, or C times V. Well, now we have to go back up to the same voltage, back up to that original one, but with an increased capacitance, remember the dielectric is still in there, so what, what happens to the charge? It increases. In fact, if V is V naught, back to the original, but the capacitance is improved by kappa, the charge will be improved. Now we're talking. Okay. Oh, and I guess I should copy this. This is still the same thing because the dielectric is still in there. So now we're able to get more charge uh, on the plates by this battery. Let's figure out what happens with the rest. Well, if the voltage goes back up to the original, then so does the net electric field. You might ask, if you have all this charge, doesn't that cause a larger electric field? Sure. But remember what we're talking about here is the net. It's the induced thing that brings it back down. So now we have a ton of charges, which causes a massive external field, very large external field, but then the induced one brings it back down to the original field that you would have had in the first place, the same one that you would have had here, E naught. Okay. So you have more charges causing a gigantic external field, causing a gigantic voltage drop. The battery would never have been able to get it up to that voltage before. But the suppression of, of the electric field by E induced and the suppression of the voltage that goes along with it brings back down to the original amount of electric field and voltage. Okay. In fact, this might be a good time to ask, what would happen if I yanked out the dielectric right at this moment? What would happen to the voltage drop across the plates without the suppression help? It would spike way up. The voltage drop across here would actually be, uh, what would that be? It'd be like 36 volts. Or what was my kappa? Yeah, 36 volts you never would have been able to get some, a capacitor charged at 36 volts with a 12 volt battery. And in fact, what would happen if it was 36 volts now? Is that gonna just sit there? No, where's the extra charge gonna go? It goes back to the battery and we go back to this, right? So if we, if we pull the dielectric out, we don't get to keep all that charge, right? Okay. The only reason we get to have that much charge without having all the voltage that would normally come with it is because of the suppressive effects of the dielectric, right? That's what allows us to get on all of this charge while still being at the same voltage and electric field overall that we were at the beginning. So we're using these suppressive effects for good use, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, and then finally we should go back and analyze the um, potential energy, PE equals one half QV. We have the same voltage as before, so the same energy per charge, that's what voltage is. But we have way more of them, right? We have more charge or number of charges. So what's going to be true of the total energy stored? It's 
it's going to increase. We have more charges, each carrying the same amount of energy, so we can have more overall energy. So this is going to increase. And again, because these two are linearly proportional, whatever factor Q is affected by, PE will be affected by. So now we're talking. We increase the energy, right? So now, if we compare the beginning, at the beginning, by the time we've charged up to this voltage, we have so and so much charge and so and so much energy. Now, at that same voltage, we get much more charge and much more energy, right? So now you can see why the dielectric is useful, okay? So dielectrics allow more charge and more potential energy to be stored at a given voltage. And I should tell you, of course, while this step, these, this kind of three-step thing was hopefully instructive, in reality, you don't, of course, charge a capacitor, disconnect it, put in a dielectric, and then put it back, okay? The dielectric's always in there. It's permanently built in. And you go straight up to these values, okay? Blissfully unaware that the amount of charge and the amount of energy you're storing are far greater than they would be if that dielectric weren't in there, okay? So, when you see capacitances on the, uh, you know, nano up to micro to millifarads and higher, those are really good dielectrics in there that are allowing you to get that high of a capacitance. Okay. Now, why is this a, why is this desirable? More charge and more potential energy at a given voltage. Um, well, I can kind of um, talk about this in terms of rechargeable batteries. They're very similar to capacitors, although not quite. Um, but if you think about trying to design like a rechargeable battery, right? You work at uh, you know Duracell or Energizer, one of these companies, right? You're trying to create the the best nine volt battery you can, right? But it's got to be nine volts. You can't say, oh, you want a best you know nine volt battery you. Uh, you could possibly have, here's a 1,000 volt battery. You don't want to connect a 1,000 volt battery to something that only expects 9 volts. It's going to draw way too much current and probably dissipate too much power and damage the thing, right? So you're restricted in a given voltage, right? You're trying to design a nine, best 9 volt battery you can, right? But the thing is, normally, if you have something that has 9 volts, that's a certain amount of charge that makes that 9 volts, right? And if you put more charge, that will make it more than 9 volts. So what you want to do is something where you can put as much charge and much energy as you can, make it long-lasting, right? That's what all those commercials are for, right? Make it longer-lasting. But longer-lasting means it has more charge available, and more charge normally comes with more voltage. So you need something to hold down the voltage, even as you put all that charge on. So that's what we have. If you have a really good dielectric, you can store more charge and more potential energy, make it longer-lasting, but hold down the voltage that would normally come with them, okay? So, that's kind of why you want to use dielectrics. Now, if you look at the equation for what goes into dielectrics, and I won't have time for this today, there are some catches. So we'll talk about some considerations for how you might build the best capacitor you possibly can. And it turns out that there are some um, situations where you can't win. You have to try to tri balance off what's good versus what's not. So um, I'll leave it there for today and we'll come back to this formula and talk about um, how we can improve a performance of a capacitor next time.